Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. Throughout the history of sports, there have been those occasional few athletes that are so scary talented that they're pretty much unbeatable and become media superstars. Uh, people like uh, Michael Jordan, uh, Tiger Woods, and, and the like. And some might even claim that uh, such superstars are using magical superpowers or perhaps even sold their souls to the devil, uh, you know, to explain away their extraordinary accomplishments. And the first true superstar of the world of auto racing was certainly accused of both of these things, and as we'll soon see, for good reason. Felice Nazaro. Born in Turin in 1881, Felice was the kind of kid you'd expect to grow up to be a supervillain. Neat, quiet, observant, yet always calculating in his head ways to conquer the world. His was a large Italian working-class family of modest means, and Nazaro was working in a local factories by the age of 12. He showed a knack for tinkering as well. He was good with tools, and at age 16, landed a job as a shop assistant for the Ceriano brothers, uh, who were at the time making the Wellized Bicycles. Yet, the owners were planning on making a change, and young Felice would be an important part of it. The Terrianos wanted to get into the car business, and so they rented out a small workshop to focus on making cars, taking Felice with them to help get it all set up. This shop happened to be located in the courtyard of the summer home of a certain Vincenzo Lancia. Giovanni Ceriano hired young Lancia as his accountant for the new business, and thus Lancia and Nazaro met and began a relationship and friendship that would last for decades. Nazaro and Lancia were both kindred spirits and quite the odd couple at the same time. Both were young, intuitive engineers and excelled at making and perfecting machines. They could talk shop for hours and often did so. Yet, the two men had very different approaches to life in general. Lancio was robust, outgoing, and flamboyant. Vincenzo loved living on the edge, taking risks and pushing limits. Felice was calm, reserved, and proper. Impeccably dressed, yet keeping to the back of the room, observing all before him, waiting for a mistake to happen so that he can swoop down from nowhere and swiftly destroy it and all involved. In 1899, the Ceriano brothers merged their company into the new Italian firm, Fiat. Now, the boss of things at Fiat was Giovanni Agnelli, and he wanted the company to establish an unstoppable racing pedigree. Lancia was his man, and over the next few years, he recruited the people that he believed would be the kind of race-winning driving team Fiat needed. And one of the first shoulders he tapped was Felice Nazaro. But there was a problem. Though Lancia recognized the potential in Nazaro, he did not have any driving experience. So, Using various connections, Lancia got Nazaro a job as a chauffeur for a rich nobleman, who just happened to be Vincenzo Florio Jr. It should come as no surprise that Felice's new boss was not interested in subtle, calm, and comfortable driving. Felice needed to learn how to drive fast, and did exactly that. Yet, though he was the chauffeur of a speed demon, he chose not to simply push the car to its limits for pure speed, but rather to keep a more moderate speed, observe the other vehicles on the road, and then make his move to get around whatever he encountered. 
This was not the typical method in an actual race situation, but it seemed to have its merits. And so young Felice Nazzaro was chosen as one of the drivers to represent Fiat and thus Italy in the 1905 Gordon Bennett Cup. Being at this point a nobody, not much was expected out of Nazzaro. Even the race bookies put him at 20 to 1. But what he did was exactly what Lancia thought he would, and it was devilish. Felice watched his boss push his car to and beyond its limits, which would result in some sort of mechanical failure, and then for the car to and the race be over. Nazzaro chose instead to keep to the rear of the pack and observe the front runners push their cars beyond their ability. Once they broke down, he would only then push his car and come out of nowhere to win the race. True, he did not win the last of the Gordon Bennett Cup races, but he did come in second, mere minutes behind the winner, Leon Theory. No small feat from an unknown. This caused our hero to no longer be an unknown. But was he just a flash in the pan? Nope. He continued racing for Fiat through to 1907 and beyond, finishing, though not winning, the 1905 and 1906 Vanderbilt Cup races. Yet it was in 1907 he would be cemented as an automobile racing god. His very Stonewall Jacksonist principle of waiting in the rear and then taking on the enemy after they've pushed themselves too far was the winning strategy of the time, and Felice was truly the first to recognize this. Thus, his 1907 racing career is the stuff of legend. This man was devilish. He lurked in the pack, watching, biding his time until the front runners did something stupid that trashed their cars. Keep in mind, his mentor was Vincenzo Lancia, and Vincenzo was exactly the kind of guy that would push his car so hard that it just flat broke. He learned from his mentor and decided to win races by letting the automotive bullies break their cars like Lancia did, and then win the race by being cautious and conservative for the most of the race, and then at the last minute, hammered down while his car can still handle it, while the front rudders were by this time worn out. Using this strategy, he won the 1907 Targa Florio, the 1907 French Grand Prix, the, you know, the second ever, and the German Kaiser Price race. Nazaro was the most winning racer in the automotive world, and he came from nowhere. He wasn't some rich noble son. He wasn't born into a wealthy family. He was just freaking awesome at auto racing, and such a phenomenon at the time was unheard of. Many reporters claimed that he had sold his soul to the devil, and like the meteoric rise of blues singer Robert Johnson, was famous for being evil, the one that comes from nowhere and takes the win. His Fiat car was named Mephistopheles by the press. Just evil. He was the race driver that you knew was there, but didn't really show up until the finish, where he'd be first. Indeed, in pre-World War I auto racing, to be in the crowd and shout, Where's Nazaro? was quite common, because everyone knew that he'd show up when least expected and take the day. How did he do this? Simple, really. He, like his friend Lencia, understood the engineering of their cars. But unlike his erstwhile friend, Nazaro did not push his cars beyond their limits and thus could finish races even with record-breaking times and not destroy the car in the process. His racing successes led to the eventual business that most sports superstars end up in, a product in their name. In 1912, he lent his name and money to a new firm to make a car, the Nazaro. These were quite good cars. The first offering, the Type 2, sported a four-cylinder engine of about 4.4 liters and could put out a very torquey 30 horses. He himself drove one of these cars in the 1913 Targa Florio, which, much to the light of his former employer, he won. 
Felice's car production was interrupted by World War I as it was requisitioned to make trucks for the government. The company didn't survive the period and after the war, Nazaro returned to Fiat driving and winning races until his ultimate retirement in 1925. He was lauded at the time as a superstar and at least to my knowledge is the first person ever to be specifically described by that term in the press in 1925. But was he really an evil man that sold his soul to the devil or was he just that much better than the competition? Well, if you have to ask that question about someone in today's world, they're probably a superstar. And modern superstars began with Felice Nazaro. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.